Welcome to the On The Air podcast, a companion to On The Air magazine, a bi-monthly magazine from ARRL for beginner to intermediate ham radio operators. I'm your host and the editor of On The Air magazine, Becky Schoenfeld, W1DXY. Every month, the On The Air podcast extends material found in On The Air magazine to help you learn about the many things the ham radio hobby and service has to offer. The On The Air podcast is sponsored by ICOM for the love of ham radio. Welcome to the October 2023 episode. In the September-October 2023 issue, we ran a story called The Solar Eclipse CUSO Party, a fun way to support radio science. Today, we're joined by the author of that story, Gary McKeaton, AF8A, who is here to talk about how you can participate in the next Solar Eclipse CUSO Party, which is just a few days away on Saturday, October 14th. Gary is the Amateur Radio Community Coordinator for an organization called HamSci. And in addition to learning some more about this upcoming QSO party, we'll also talk a little bit about who HamSci is and what they do. Welcome, Gary. Good morning, Becky. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for being with us today. So we've got a solar eclipse heading our way on October 14th. And it sounds like we've got some on-air fun to go with it in the form of the Solar Eclipse QSO Party, or SEQP. So what is the SEQP, and when did it get started? Well, there's actually, I guess I would say, two components to the SEQP. Uh, part of it, and, and the most visible one for amateur radio operators, is, is an operating event. Um, there'll be about uh, a 10-hour event where folks are encouraged to get on the air, uh, make QSOs, whether it's on Morse code, on voice, or the digital modes like FT8, and simply make QSOs or contacts during the 10-hour contest period. Um, that's, that's fairly common for most QSO parties and, and, and sort of thing. The other half of it is the science that's behind all this. Uh, the reason we're doing this is to collect data um, from amateur radio contacts to better understand how our ionosphere works. And of course, if you're an, a high frequency HF operator, uh, you're probably familiar with the fact that our signals leave Earth, bounce off or refract off the ionosphere, come back to Earth, and that's how we can our signals can cover such long distances. So scientists are, are curious sorts, and they're uh, trying to understand how the ionosphere works a little better. Great. And so this event has been going on for at least a little while now. I remember there was one um, back in, was it 2017? There was a CUSO party that went along with a big eclipse. Yes, we've, uh, we've uh, since HamSci is a, is a U.S.-centric organization, uh, we, we try to time these to meet up with the uh, total solar eclipses across the United States. And you're correct, it was August of 2017 when we last had our full eclipse across the U.S. So, um, and I remember that folks, uh, we were promoting the, the SEQP for, for that eclipse and, uh, and hams were planning to get on the air and be active in this CUSO party. Um, and uh, so now here we are again with another eclipse coming and another CUSO party. Now I'm given to understand that CUSO parties in general can be more a little more low key than a lot of radio sport events there there are a few hard hitting ones that i know people look forward to but um, in general they tend to be a little more casual a little more fun and is this kind of what the seqp is like yeah that's exactly right uh yeah. it, you know some some radio sport contests you'll, you'll find people making uh, tens dozens or even hundreds of contacts per hour and that's probably not going to be the case with the SEQP. Um, if uh, people want to get on and, and basically operate at their own pace, that's fine. If you make two or three contacts an hour or, or, or 50 or 60 contacts per hour, either way, you're, you're creating contacts, you're, you're hopefully filling up your log, and you're providing data for the scientists and the researchers to use uh, in, in the months and years ahead. So how beginner-friendly is this? On the air's readers tend to be... Um, they're, they're all licensed classes, you know, they're tech, general, extra, 
but regardless of license class or how long they've held that license, they tend to consider themselves more um, beginner, intermediate knowledge level. So where can somebody who feels like they're at that level fit in in a, an event like this? I think there's a lot of opportunities for them. I mean, the, the first and most important thing is probably to read through the rules on the HAMSI website and just get an idea of the times of the contest, uh, what bands are allowed, because uh, uh, we'll, we'll typically be on six through 160 meters. Whatever band somebody has the capabilities for would be fine. Um, people can pick their favorite mode, whether, again, it's voice, CW, FT8, uh, RIDI, uh, a lot of things like that. Um, and there's really no need to to rush into the thing. You know, the, the contest will start at 1200 universal time on Saturday morning. And there's no reason somebody can't get on, listen, hear how others are making contact, uh, become comfortable kind of with the rhythm, and then uh, maybe just jump in. If somebody calls CQ, SEQP, jump in and say, hey, this is my call. I'm AF8A. They'll answer you. They'll exchange some very simple information with you, a signal report, and your grid square. So, uh, of course, every QSO, the signal report is going to vary. But if you know what your grid square is ahead of time, that's pretty important. Um, you're, you're set to operate. So it sounds like folks have a lot of um, lot of latitude in how they can choose to operate this event. They have a number of bands they can choose from. Um, sounds like they can use pretty much uh, almost any mode. Um, do are there any requirements? Like, do you have to be in uh, the path of totality, or can you be anywhere? Well, uh, that's part of the beauty of it. Um, the no matter where somebody is located, um, they can get on the air, they can make contacts, and their data will be valuable to the researchers. Um, because part of the, the data we'll be using are the actual logs if somebody's maintaining an electronic log and, and some, some sort of logging software. But the other part of it is if uh, people have heard about uh, what we call it spotting networks, uh, there's a couple of websites called PSK Reporter and things like that. Many of these websites, or excuse me, many of these stations have automated receivers that'll pick up and record your QSO data. And uh, no matter where you're at, these stations will pick it up, record it, and that's part of what we'll use for the research in the future. So certainly the one of the exciting things about this event, you know, not only is there going to be an eclipse, but also all we have to do is get on the air and make contacts and those contacts um, are going to somehow be used uh, in scientific research. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Who are the researchers that are going to be looking at this data? Are you able to say what organizations they're part of? Sure. Uh, the the, the HAMSI organization, which has been around since uh, late 2016, uh, is led by uh, an amateur operator, Whiskey 2, Nancy, Alpha Foxtrot, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Purcell, and he's associated with the University of Scranton. Uh, we've also got researchers who are HAMS at um, New Jersey Institute of Technology. We've got people at places like Virginia Tech, Case Western Reserve. So there's a, a pretty good spread. Um, we've been talking with folks at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic and even the West Point Military Academy. Uh, they've got an amateur radio club and they'll be participating as well. So in looking at um, the logs, in looking at the data that they'll be getting from those um, receiving stations, um, they're going to be gathering information about how radio signals are reflected from the ionosphere. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so it, it's actually fairly simple the way the, the methodology we use. I mean, if you can imagine, you know, say a few hours before the eclipse, there may be a lot of stations making contacts over, say, a 350-mile path, which would say between, for me, would be between Cleveland and Washington, D.C. So we'll be recording and monitoring the bands, and we'll see a lot of QSOs between, again, say, Cleveland and Washington, D.C. When the eclipse passes overhead, and, of course, the skies darken and the sun is no longer uh, uh, illuminating the top side of the ionosphere, we may see those QSOs disappear. All of a sudden, people in Cleveland, like myself, may not be reaching out all the way to Washington, D.C. Our QSOs, as the eclipse passes overhead, may go 
much shorter distances, say Cleveland to Pittsburgh or Cleveland to Detroit. And that's one of the things that we'll be able to detect is the fact that QSOs have either shortened up or lengthened out because of the eclipse. And then once the eclipse passes overhead, uh, the, the sun illuminates both the ionosphere and the surface of the earth. It gets nice and bright outside and hopefully a sunny day again. We may see those QSOs stretch back out. So again, I may again be contacting people in, uh, in Washington, D.C. or or Chicago or, or places west over those longer distances. So what we're really looking for is the change in the characteristics of the QSOs as the eclipse comes and goes. Okay, and uh, so all uh, a regular ham has to do to, to be part of contributing to that data is just get on the air during the 10 hours of the solar eclipse QSO party, make contacts according to the QSO party's rules, submit a log, and they are suddenly a citizen scientist contributing data to this larger project. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the, the whole concept of citizen science is, is very broad. I mean, a lot of people think about citizen science often as, as people that are into birding or collecting butterflies or you know, monitoring the quality of rivers and that sort of thing. But there's a lot of more uh, astro, astrophysics type related things where folks are looking at auroras, um, they're looking at trying to discover new planets and asteroids and that sort of thing. And for HAMSI, our part of the citizen science is really this understanding of, of radio wave propagation. So will the findings um, from the SEQP, will they'll certainly be helpful to HAMS. Um, does this information have any implications for the general public? It sure does. Um, I, I guess an analogy I could use is, is our terrestrial weather. I mean, I don't know about where you're at in New England, but in, in, in Ohio, when I was thinking back 30 or 40 years, the weather forecast, the regular old rain, snow, wind, temperature were very inaccurate. Um, but over time, scientists collected more and more weather data. Uh, some of it was ground data, some of it was some satellites and so on and so forth. But what they were able to use with that weather data was to improve what we call the models of the weather models. So they could, they could do a better job of predicting the weather. And what we want to do, one of the things we're hoping to do is to improve the mathematical models of the ionosphere. I mean, today there's a number of websites you can go to. Um, you can plug in some solar data like solar flux numbers and that sort of thing where you're located and you'll get a prediction of you know how likely it is you're able to make a contact say between in Cleveland, Ohio and Miami, Florida. Um, those predictions are a little a little sketchy. They're, they're, they're good, but they could be a lot better. And if, if we can use this this QSO data from the QSO party to improve those models, Maybe someday we'll get to the point where you can go to a website, type in your coordinates and, and a buddy's coordinates, uh, some solar flux data, time of year, that sort of thing, and maybe get back a pretty good prediction of whether or not you'll be able to have a QSO on, on a given band. That's great. So there are implications for hams uh, being able to do the things they enjoy even more uh, accurately and more successfully and as well as the general public who's maybe trying to get to work on a, a snowy morning and want to know uh, how they might have to time their drive in. Uh, it's pretty cool. The other oh. thing that we have to realize too is that, that many other signal, radio signals besides the amateurs pass through the ionosphere. For instance, uh, if you take the many uh, satellite-based internet services, there are, those satellites are either flying through or above the ionosphere and those signals have to pass through there our GPS satellite constellations, those signals pass through the ionosphere. So having a better understanding of how the ionosphere works can, as you say, very, very greatly aid the general public who's making use of, of those types of services. Um, so you are with HAMSI, an organization that's been around since, I believe you said 2016. Um, can you tell us a little more about the kinds of things that HAMSI is engaged in. Um, the, the science of ham radio is, tends to be the province of, um, you know, there, there are plenty of hams who like to just put up a simple station, get on the air, talk to their friends. Um, there are plenty of hams who like to use ham radio to serve their communities. And there's also a subset of hams that's really interested in 
the science and technology that is at the core of this pursuit. So uh, tell us a little bit about the kinds of things HAMSI does. Sure, we've got, um, uh, over the years, there's probably a half a dozen, uh, half a dozen or so major projects that HAMSI has been involved with, one of which, of course, are the QSO parties and the actual eclipse events. But there's also a, a group of people working on what are called grape uh, receivers. They're very tiny uh, shortwave receivers they're designed to receive a single frequency, say like WWD, the time and frequency station that's out in Fort Collins. And by receiving those uh, stations and very accurately measuring the frequency of WWV, we're able to get some idea how the ionosphere is moving, some of the dynamics, because the ionosphere goes up and down during the day, uh, partially because of the day-night transitions, but also because of a lot of other things that the, the sun does for us. So there's the, the great receiver project, um, trying to think of a few others, but uh, now, of course, it left me at the moment. I know they have uh, an annual conference um, where a lot of the, the uh, updates on these projects are presented. Yes, HAMSI does have a, an annual conference, usually about in the March time frame. It's been held at the University of Scranton a few times uh, in Alabama. And uh, next year it'll be in the Cleveland area. So that's where many of the, both the scientists and the citizen scientists such as myself and, and others who will be operating the QSO party will get together and discuss some of the findings. And they'll also talk about future projects and endeavors that we, we may want to get involved with. Great. So um, folks who are listening to or watching this episode who might want to get involved uh, with HAMSI and the work that they do, we are coming up on a really easy and fun way to get involved. Um, October 14th, there will be a 10 hour solar eclipse QSO party. And if you want more information about that, including the rules, you can go to HAMSCI, which is H-A-M-S-C-I, HAMSCI.org slash S-E-Q-P hyphen rules. Um, so you can get all the information about the QSO party there. That is Saturday, October 14th. And uh, if you are listening to or watching this podcast after that date and, and you're sad that you missed out, there is another eclipse and another corresponding solar eclipse QSO party coming up in April, on April 8th, 2024. So, uh, so hopefully you're ready to go for the 14th, but uh, if you missed out, then you can get more information about the April 8th event on the webpage that I just mentioned. So uh, Gary, thank you so much for being here. Gary McKeaton, AF8A. Um, from Hamsai, and uh, thanks a lot, Gary. And uh, the podcast will be back in November, 73. Thank you very much, Becky. I've enjoyed the interview this morning. You take care.